Now, I want to say and just remind us all that at that time, they didn't have all the medical knowledge and scientific knowledge that we have now. And so attributing illnesses to demon was just a way that they understood maybe the source or cause of some illnesses. Um, clearly, in some cases, the people that we meet in the New Testament are suffering from mental illnesses. In the same way, when the Bible talks about leprosy, um, that actually is a word that covered all kinds of different skin diseases. And that's okay. But I don't want us to give up that language, that powerful language of the demonic, because we too still can get taken over. And we can get possessed. And so I want us to think about, you know, at least our vision what of a demon. You're probably going, yeah, the exorcist, right? Or some, some movie like that. But it's more helpful. Let's think about what does a demon do? Anybody? What does a demon do to a person? Tempts us. It tempts us. Yes. Say it louder. Manipulates. Manipulates. Yes. Torments. Torments. Yes. It destroys, yes, and it takes over a person, doesn't it? It possesses you, right? You're possessed. It takes over you. You see this issue of identity, and it's a battle, and Jesus is battling for your identity. We are legion. That's a scary phrase from Scripture, and it's still true today. There's lots of things that try to crowd us out and take over our lives. I see you nodding, I know this. I was trying to think of like some simple example of what crowds us out, just so we can think about that this week. What's crowding out our true identity, you know, and kind of taking over our lives and our time and that sort of thing. All I could think of was a headache. I, I've just got to get a new pillow. <laughs> My pillow is completely flat and I've gotten several headaches this week. <laughs> and a headache crowds you, crowds you out, doesn't it, of your thoughts and your ability to work and function. Then I saw this funny story, maybe you did too. Um, I'm glad I don't ride the New York subways, but did you see the story that the study was done and they swabbed like the subways, and, you know, and so they found out that there was like, in addition to the normal human ridership, there's like 15,000 other life forms anywhere from, yes, rodents, crickets, or something, but a lot of it is my, microbial bacteria, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, crowding us out of our space, right? Our identity. You'll come up with something else, but a demon is anything that crowds you out so you don't get to be you. Hey, here's a good example, though. Mary Magdalene. If you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 2, Mary Magdalene was possessed of seven demons, and Jesus delivered her. Who did Mary Magdalene become once she was freed and once she had a blessed clarity about who she was going to be and who she belonged to in this life? And she was the first witness to the resurrection. That's a good example. She was a beloved daughter of the king. That's who she was. Do you have this clarity? Do you live in a world changed? Are you changed by the touch of Christ? Do you live with a sense of his presence and his purpose for you? What things are preventing you from being you, who he created you to be. From saying, yes, this is what I came to do. Because over and over, Jesus tells us and reminds us who we are. You are light. You can't change that. He's made you to be light for the world. You are salt to give flavor to the world. You're like leaven and bread for the world. This is who you are. But so many things distract us and hide that truth from us. 
and tempt us. You know, just to hear today that you are beloved daughters and sons of the King means that you came to church today and you have now experienced a healing because you heard who you are again. The healing story becomes a story of our identity and our purpose. So we can say, this is what I came to do. And that's true for us as a church as well. That's the last place I want to talk about. As a church as well, we need to keep asking these questions of who we are and what we have come to do together in mission. I will tell you that I get discouraged when I hear stories about the ghost of church past. Jim remembers growing up, uh, seeing an advertisement in the movie theaters in Springfield, Missouri. And um, it was a, an advertisement that always said, attend the church of your choice. And maybe some of you remember this too. Because in that time, there was a social expectation that going to church made you a good citizen. And that's just what you did. It was just a, an automatic, you know, an automatic thing that you did. That's not today. Today, though, we can be sure that when we come to church, it's authentic and real. Today, the church is very much more like that early church in the Acts of the Apostles. And I'm so glad one of our small groups is looking at that. We're much more like that time. We live in a secular society, pluralistic society. And you know what? It didn't hamper the early church at all, did it? They were alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. They were intentional and they knew their identity and mission. That's a stronger church to be in. One where we are constantly seeking a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. Yesterday at the Synod Conferences, I heard a story we should pay attention to. It's a sad story. A woman told about a man who came to her church looking, he was looking for a church to belong to. She said the man came from Africa, and uh, the first Sunday he came, lots of people came up to him and said, welcome. And he thought, well, this might be the church that I, I could join and belong to. And so he came back, and the same thing happened the next Sunday. Lots of people came up and said, welcome. And so on and so on until about the eighth week, and people came up to him again and said, welcome. And he realized he couldn't belong to this church. You see, he wasn't getting past that, was he? Bishop Ann Svenningsen uh, talked about joining a church in Atlanta when they moved there. And she has a, a differently abled young adult son. The second week they were there, they had found a job for John to do. He was ringing the bells. See the difference? I saw the difference here Monday night at our new spirituals practice group. Two of the women that came had just worshipped here for the first time the day before. And they are looking for an intentional, transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is so exciting, isn't it? And what a gift for us. They are. To remind us of that hunger in that seeking, and that authenticity. I'm so grateful what God is doing right here. So we've got a song, Give Me Jesus. Morning, noon, and night, it's perfect. Before we sing it, I want to just, I just want to go back to Peter's mother-in-law one more time. Because healing is a sign of the kingdom's arrival in our midst. 
But her deeper healing was that relationship with Jesus. That transcended everything else in importance. Because one day, Peter's mother-in-law died. Yes, she was healed of the flu that day, but it was the transcending relationship with Jesus Christ that raised her up again. And she felt that familiar presence and Jesus' hand on her arm again. And she knew that time what it was. And that time it was forever. And that's what's most important. So we're going to sing Give Me Jesus, and I want you to keep singing it all week. And uh, let's sing it now, and then I'll have a prayer at the end. 